Hi, I'm Ann Rieselbach, the Architectural League's Program Director, and I'd like to welcome you to this month's FF Distance Edition, hosted by the Boston-based firm Kennedy and Bialage Architecture. During this time of necessary spatial and social constraints, these programs reinvent the League's in-person, studio-based First Fridays with online visits to design practices across North America. Almost counterintuitively, these events, which often include studio tours and site visits, have expanded opportunities for the League's audience to experience firsthand, albeit virtually, the context for each firm's work. You can find videos of past FF Studio visits on the League's website. Upcoming programs include next month's visit to Studio Gang in Chicago, and later in the spring, visits to LA Moss and a Studio Rosanna Montiel. This year's series is focused on architecture practices who expand disciplinary boundaries by taking on multiple roles, including design advocacy, fabrication, research, and community engagement, which brings us to tonight's program led by Sheila Kennedy and Frano Vialich, founding principles of Kennedy and Vialich. Sheila and Frano founded KBA in 1990 and 10 years later founded Maddox, a materials research unit which engages applied creative production across the fields of design, electronics, architecture, and material science, creating a new model for practice that integrates material research with the practice of architecture with an emphasis on sustainable strategies. KVA Maddox engages design across scales, exploring architecture, resilient urban design, and new forms of infrastructure for emerging public needs. In tandem with their multifaceted practice, Sheila and Frano are engaged in academia as well as in civic and professional realms. Sheila is currently professor of the practice of architecture at MIT and was formerly an associate professor at Harvard's GSD, where she was director of the MRH2 program from 1991 to 95. Frano has held visiting professorships at a number of institutions nationwide, has served as the design commissioner of the Boston Society of Architects, and is currently chair of the executive committee for the Design and Industry Group of Massachusetts, working with leaders in government, business, and education to advance design as an integral part of the Massachusetts innovation economy. Here at the League, we've watched their practice develop and diversify for over 30 years. They were 1989 winners of the League Prize for Young Architects and Designer, whose theme was public work, 1994 Emerging Voices, and their New York City ferry structures, including the East 34th Street Ferry Terminal, were featured in the League's 2002 exhibition, New New York Three, with its focus on innovative small scale civic works. Today, they'll be sharing their workspace, discussing four re recent projects that exemplify the firm's approach to an integrative architecture at every scale, from objects and buildings to the civic realm merging design with tangible solutions for pressing issues of the time, embracing strategies for sustainability, including clean energy and new applications for biomaterials. In addition to producing the program, we ask each firm to identify a program moderator who will have an affinity for the ideas underlying their work. Tonight's event will be moderated by Rania Gosen, who is an associate professor of architecture and urbanism at MIT School of Architecture and Planning and founding partner with El Hadi Chazere of the practice Design Earth. Rania's research engages the territories of technological systems to address aesthetic and political concerns for, concerns for architecture and urbanism. Her firm's work integrates geography and a design methodology that brings together spatial history, geographic representation, speculative design and public assemblies, all evocatively illustrated and explicated in their publications, Geography of Trash and Geostories, Another Architecture for the Environment. Following the presentation and Rania's discussion with Sheila, Frano, and other members of the KBA Maddox team, the discussion will be open to all attendees, at which point we hope you will turn your cameras back on, please keep them off along with your microphones during the presentation, to make this feel as close to a real gathering as we can approximate by Zoom, which means yes, you can privately message with each other too. You can pose your questions in the chat section and when possible, and if you feel comfortable doing so, we invite you to ask them in person when called on. Last month, I understand there were some glitches with the chat functionality, so please be persistent. And finally, information will be posted in the chat section for those seeking CEUs for attending tonight's program. Matt, we take it to uh, Sheila and Frano. Thank you very much. 
Great, thank you, Anne. Um, it's, it's really a pleasure to be back with the league um, this evening. And uh, Rania, thank you so much um, for agreeing to moderate after our talk and also for appearing tonight in a greenhouse, um, which is a very uh, beautiful setting uh, for you. And um, FF, we wondered what that meant. Um, and never really told us. Um, uh, and given given our interests, um, what what have you come up with? So I uh, picked up the invitation to come to your world on on uh, on this evening, and I thought full on uh, in the world of uh, of KVA, uh, maybe some plants, water, some soil and earth and air throughout. So we're breathing together. I'm glad to have spent uh, some time thinking of, of the work and of your probe on FF. So we came up with a fake fecus because we're, we're thinking of artificiality, plants and construction, but then French fries picked up. So we couldn't let that one go. But what should we, uh, what should we come up with as well? I think um, I'll settle on family and friends because you're going to pick up uh, the KVA broader design research family operation and I'll happily join you again at the end of the session as a as a friend for the practice. Perfect. Family and friends it is. Also future forest. We're going to put that on the table. Um, uh, Laura Foray was another one we came up with. Yeah. And, and also Prano about, Films. Um, that was definitely. I'll take, uh, I'll take that. Right. I, I think just in the effort of uh, time here, how about FF uh, fast forward? Right. Fast forward. forward. Let's go. Let's hit the key. Got it. We'll do that. Key. So what we're going to do before we hit the play button is Frano and I are going to take you on a whirlwind tour of KVA in our neighborhood. And then we're going to show you kind of behind the scenes and somewhat informally super quick four projects, and we'll be giving you four uh, virtual tours of those, those projects. So let's go, FF. Here we go. Hi, I'm Prano. We are here at KBA's office. Uh, we're in the Roxbury neighborhood of Boston. It's an industrial zoned area. So uh, let's go in, I'll show you inside. Uh, when we got here, all the streets were uh, kind of messed up, the sidewalks were dirt, no lighting. Uh, our building was abandoned, this building was abandoned. So we've been working with the city for the past many several years, planting trees, doing the sidewalks, new lighting. So it's been a community effort to make this a better place to set up work. So welcome to the studio and the former Bluebird bottling plant that used to produce this stuff until thankfully people came to their senses. A 120 year old building that we've transformed as a place to design, make things, cook food and work together. And, um, I guess, you know, fundamentally, uh, it's, it, it could seem uh, anachronistic, you know, to have to have a workshop. But if you if you think about the, the job of the architect, it's 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 kind of like um, imagining a possible future and then, you know, um, designing a set of instructions to get us from the present to there. And a big part of that involves organizing material and, and organizing forms of labor to do that. And having a shop really confronts us with those, with those choices. Yeah, I mean, it's really a tool for us to be able to have a a studio space, a workspace that we designed, that we laid out, we know in terms of uh, material handling, uh, what kind of tools we have, what kind of tools we need. A lot of it's about capacity and what we know we can do. Um, but we actually have a um, one of Boston's largest wood pellet companies right next door. And um, we go there often with our wood waste to recycle it so it can be turned into wood pellets um, for, for stoves. Yeah, re-energy just right across the way. So it's literally a place where we can get a, a truck, we can load it up. And we have an agreement. This is a community of people that uh, work together to try to make this place a better place to, to live and work. And so we have an agreement where we can take our materials over there and then we help as designers make this area 
much better in terms of this, its physical environment. Um, we also have a opto shop um, where we have a lot of uh, solid state uh, capability. We do all of our sensor stuff there. All of our photovoltaic work is, is in that separate shop. And in this ground floor, we wanted to make the shop representative of who we were. Um, and we, we wanted to put ours on the ground floor, have natural light, and it's really the first thing that you see when you, when you walk in. When I think about the, the different kinds of projects that we've done, um, they can be characterized into kind of several um, different conceptual bins. Um, we've done a lot of work about rethinking um, the materials that are used in architecture, how those materials are sourced and actually which materials should be used and kind of reimagining what interior, um, what an interior could be like. So part of that is really eviscerating everything, stripping it down, and um, being very selective about what we put into um, a building. So there's a whole bunch of work around that. Um, and we've also been very interested in um, making the most out of the standardized wood uh, products that characterize the American building industry. So for a really long time, super long time, we've been interested in a very kind of banal um, construction materials like a balloon frame, mm -hmm. two by fours. And I think it is really interesting now to, to think about, um, you know, reframing all of those, those materials um, and looking at them as systems. And then from there, I mean, because of the the Z dimension of some of the capacity of the Z dimension in terms of our mill it, it's, and, and its limitations, we've pretty much kept with panels like the plywood. So we've really researched that. And another area is where do we go from just a flat panel to a three, something three-dimensional? So we've been looking at uh, flat to form. So for example, what can we do? How can we get the most out of the plywood with the least amount of waste and the most accessible fasteners. Yeah. So there are these undercurrents um, of research projects around fabrication that are always sort of living just below our more formal projects, you know, of architecture um, that are sort of ready then to, to pop out when needed. These very um, kind of non-standard funky uh, forms, this, this particular wood was pretty significantly eaten by insects. So what to do with that? How do we um, become, as architects, more accepting of this, which is actually the real way that wood is, as opposed to a standard dimensioned, dried, you know, two by four. So as designers through computation, we can advance how that craft is, um, is improved, is challenged by form making, uh, being more sustainable in terms of how it's used, the provenance of the material. So what we know, the kind of agency that we bring as architects to the construction industry is really one of the biggest challenges and that's a lot about where our interest is in and that's why I think people are interested in coming to our studio. We continually need to re-educate ourselves. Right about materi the materials that surround us because they are so transparent and they've not been, you know, th there haven't been accounts made of them. Was that it? <laughs> I think that's it. Okay. You might need to open this again. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so yeah. we're gonna kick it off with uh, the short intro and the stories about the four recent projects. No one has seen this one, so it's a it's a it's a reveal right here. Right, still coming together. True. <clears throat> uh, so this is a historic building, in in a couple of ways. Uh, first of all, it was built in the early 1950s by an architect, Ralph Walker. Uh, but the other way it's historic is that you know it looks like some giant urban uh, entrance portico. Uh, that everybody would go through. In fact, it was the main entrance to Hayden Library. You can see the crowds of people. That was the that was the vision of this. But in fact, the entire campus is on the other side of this building, not facing the Charles River. So it was closed down as an entrance, and um, the interior was also you know very historic in a way. Uh, this this was this this kind of Gentile. Uh, you know, all men in here and sort of struggling between am I 
a living room or am I a warehouse? And it's sort of caught between the two, which was really a problem for libraries. But and mostly, then, mostly a warehouse, really. Um, <laughs> yes. And um, then we, you know, fast forward to 70 years and nothing has really changed much. And we're kind of stuck with this, uh, what we used to call the barn and a barn without the charm. Uh, you know, you had all the light coming in from one side, but there was absolutely no light coming from the north side, which is actually where a courtyard is, which she was going to tell you about. And also the proportions were so difficult, there's light just was getting to the middle. Um, so the orange, um, the orange building is the building we're talking about, Hayden Library. Um, it occupies three floors in building 14, which is the humanities and social sciences building. And it's really a network of libraries, um, and, but it's not very well connected either to the programs around it or really to the MIT campus. And so we launched into this Hack the Library series of dialogues and programs with students and um, with the libraries team to try to really unpack the modern program as a library and think about it uh, differently. So we did a lot of the typical things. We benchmark um, things that students were interested in, um, these learning spaces, biophilia spaces and offices, different kinds of flexible classrooms. And at the same time, um, we jumped into a really significant technical challenge because as you can imagine, the infrastructure in this building was inherited much of it from the 1950s or the late 1970s. So for Vera Happel, um, for Ned and the whole um, uh, team at KDA, it was, it was quite a technical challenge to upgrade all the infrastructure um, in the building. So this is what we inherited. Um, that gray bar is, a, is two stories solid of mezzanines. The rest of the space is this giant extruded kind of barn with no mid scale in it, no variation. Um, and we had to keep the elevator shaft because that wasn't moving. Um, so we were able to actually use the diagonal, remove those mezzanines, free up the view to the courtyard and introduce programs that were about the body. Um, analog books, um, maps, the cafe. And then we crossed that with another set of program spaces that was really about um, digital learning and uh, studying together using digital media. Um, you can see that dashed line is the size of the small opening that we were allowed to make to connect um, the two floors of the library. We subdivided the courtyard to produce a kind of a, uh, to complete the, the corridor uh, around the library and the rest of building 14. And then finally, we renovated the courtyard, which we'll talk about in a minute. So we now have a library that has a corridor with a cafe in it, open 24 hours, that's connected to the courtyard and to the rest of the building. So this is kind of showing you the various different program elements of the two bars and how they cross, crossing in plan, but they're also gonna cross up in section. They cross, and for the first time, we are connecting all floors of Caden internally with a new stair system. So rendering, you know, it's always uh, nice and light, um, but then when you, know, you go to the site, it's quite a different story to kind of really open that up. Um, this will be a lead uh, gold building. It's also fit well, which is a new criteria that MIT is experimenting with, which is about healthy building materials on the inside. So actually, as it, as it turned out, Hayden did have its own biophilia space already. It was called the Lipschitz Courtyard. And it kind of suffered over the years, as you can see, the music library was blasted with sunlight, curtains had to be drawn, it became locked. Um, there was, there's no soil here and it was not accessible. I mean, you couldn't move from the corridors down the steps you know, into the courtyard. So what we, what we tried to do is, is reintroduce earth and soil um, and we had to follow the tree grid so that the weight of these uh, trees could be borne by the structural grid of the building. We added this pavilion, a hackable space in the, in the courtyard. And you can see here in yellow, the kind of interlocking way in which all three floors of the uh, Hayden Library are now um, connected. And so there was quite a lot of um, you know, architectural thought that went into making a wall that could disappear at times and could cross between inside and outside and, and be a place on campus, one of really one of the only places on campus that, that I'm aware of where you can um, be in a building 
and actually have nothing between you and trees. You can actually reach out and, and see these katsura trees. So the interior was a kind of a crossing, literally graphically, and this became a crossing between the inside and the outside. Yeah, so Frano and yeah. Ned went on site, and we'll, we'll show you that now. The Hayden Library and adjacent Building 14 Courtyard are two formerly distinct spaces that we were able to bring together to extend the spatial concept of crossroads. I'll take you through the courtyard and Frano will show you the library. The design of the courtyard and pavilion established physical, visual, and structural connections between natural elements in the new landscape and the interior of the reimagined library, connections that were never possible in the internally focused 1951 design. Building 14 has one of the only enclosed courtyards on the MIT campus. The 1951 design identified it as a potential expansion space to house the library's growing collection of post-World War II documents. The existing columns in the basement stacks were oversized so additional stacks could be built up into the space of the courtyard. Working with Stimson Associates, we took advantage of this, the structure's additional capacity, to fill the courtyard with soil and get sufficient depth to plant trees and create a topography with enough elevation and slope that the planted landscape could be made visible like a raked stage from the library and building interior. The pavilion is thought of as a three season porch that extends the use of the courtyard and allows people to spend as much time as possible in the natural environment. The design goal was to dissolve the wall between the library and nature. This entire space opens with the accordion doors that will be installed tomorrow to allow you to sit in an ambiguous interior and exterior space. The project also gave us the opportunity to work with the contractors to create a wood ceiling, which we fabricated in our shop. We CNC milled the ash veneer ceiling panels with abstracted leaf and vine patterns that are inset with sound absorbing materials which perform acoustically to reduce reverberation. A 70 foot long steel sunshade is perforated with similar leaf patterns, which cast dappled light on the pavilion floor. The space is heated but not cooled since doors will be open during the cooling season. This design, which minimizes energy use and maximizes passive cooling through ventilation and shading, allowed us to add space without increasing loads to existing building air handlers. The courtyard and pavilion established nature as the primary actor in the architectural expression of the project and use it to transform the character and quality of the new library and library cafe spaces. The intent is to allow the same research and collaborative activities that occur inside the library to cross over into the pavilion and courtyard to make the entire project a healthier and more welcoming destination on the MIT campus. Hayden Library as an interior spatial experience was completely reimagined as a crossroads between researchers of the library's collections, students and faculty looking for a place to exchange ideas, and a place where analog and digital production could coexist. So as we move through the space, we use geometry, the figure of an X, to express this intersection. Cork and wood material provide the surfaces for the cafe pavilion and floor, representing an analog axis. And glass, including glass embedded in the terrazzo floor, is used on another pavilion where digital printing and reproduction happen. A core concept of the library is that it needs to be hackable. In other words, students and faculty need to take ownership of the place, bring food and coffee into the collections area, pull curtains, which I think are being installed next week, to form and reconfigure study spaces, to self-check out books while still having access to support services of the library staff. Maybe the most radical intervention was to take the X in plan and pull it up through the Z-axis through the lid of the former first floor reading room to its twin reading room on the second floor. The original Hayden Library was a tank, we called it the barn, a concrete box designed on a strict orthogonal grid and compartmentalized by programmatic functions. It had an ungainly proportion both in plan and section which prevented light from getting to the center. So we had to open it up. And structurally, the stair wasn't going to work unless we found a large enough opening to thread it through the 50s concrete structure, which we ended up finding with, with minimal perimeter reinforcing. So this becomes yet another crossroads, connecting a space on the first floor, where the majority of books are replaced with people talking, eating, and holding public events, including a student-focused mezzanine overlooking it, the cafe and the courtyard, 
with a very different space on the second floor, a space for quiet study overlooking the Charles River to the south. Next one, please. All right, we're just going to move through um, these. The second project is the Global Flora um, Conservatory, a botanical facility at Wellesley College. And um, in 1925, um, Margaret Ferguson, um, who founded the first Global Flora Greenhouse, had this in pretty incredible vision. She imagined that women should have hands-on contact with plant science and plants. Um, and for her, the, the greenhouses at Wellesley, she thought should be a center for the campus and really for all the sciences. And we've always liked this image of um, Dr. Ferguson's students, particularly the woman on the left, who we think is actually listening to plants. Um, and that kind of attentive, attentiveness to plants and having plants as clients um, has always sort of um, been, been behind our thinking in this project. Um, the original greenhouses that she uh, had built, you can see on the right, are pretty much like those um, from, from three centuries ago that you see on the left. All the plants were in pots. The ground was completely flat, except one tree, the Durant camellia tree, was actually in the native soil. So when we built the new greenhouses, we actually kept the roots in spot. We did not move the tree. We actually built the greenhouse around um, the Durant tree. It has 150 more years uh, to live. So Global Flora is a public institution. It's open to the public. It's connected to the public school systems in Massachusetts on Wellesley's campus. Um, and it's also connected globally through a real-time um, sensor network that measures um, a lot of plant biology, soil um, status, uh, carbon monoxide and oxygen in the air and many other things that bring plants in different different parts of the world together um, through this, this sensor network. So how to transform this kind of complex of greenhouses, uh, where, which actually weren't even visible uh, be, and one of the one of the many of the students didn't even know that it was there to something that was expressive of the idea of global flora, which is really all about the diversity of form. So how could the architecture express this? So what we ended up doing was we pulled the the, the building to the edge, working with Andrew Andrew Kogan, a landscape architect in Philadelphia. We pulled it to the toe of the slope, um, and then worked with that topography with that contour line, which sort of curved the building, which also allowed mm -hmm. the sun to kind of follow along. It. And the soil goes right through in section. And one, one more thing was that in, in terms of that being on the, on the edge, then we were able to step the, the, the building down or slope the building down and gain a lot more Southern exposure. You can see on the right side, that the trauma wall is, is shorter than the other side. So we got a lot more Southern exposure while it curves as, as well. And we did this working with TransSolar. Mm -hmm. So basically in a nutshell, it's a passive on um, the both, both biomes, the dry and the wet are passive. It's a living building challenge building, um, which means it uses all its own water and, and will use all its own power, uh, which is actually a pretty challenging uh, metric um, to produce, um, especially for uh, a greenhouse. So this is a view inside. Um, you can see the, how, how steep the section is here and you'll, you'll go inside in a minute. And in the plan, um, that line right down the middle, at, I think number 10, um, shows this very thin ETFE boundary between the dry desert biome and the wetter, um, more, more humid tropical biome. And you can also see the pavilion with the Durant camellia tree in it um, just off the, uh, the entry. Um, and the building ties into the visitor center. Um, so here we, we see it again in section, um, that dashed line we added just shows the boundary point. And we wanted to use the change of grade, which occurs in the long second uh, section, because this is a lofted building, it's not an extrusion, um, to, to kind of fold up the ground in different ways and, and produce different ways of experiencing and looking at the plants. Um, and this is kind of cool. This is the, the before the door was installed, um, which is a series of flaps that you can push through um, like in a, in a market. And um, the whole point of, of the, of the um, global flora is, is to compare plant form. 
So here we're looking at a dry uh, plant and then beyond it, you see its version in the wet. So it's much taller, it has a different kind of leaf. And so you can make these kinds of comparisons um, between the plant morphology. Um, we use, yeah, we use local cedar, which on the, on the north side and found ways just to have enough light leak in from the north because you do need some north light for uh, greenhouses. And then this window was to kind of celebrate that moment where the wet biome um, became the uh, dry biome. Uh, what you see here is the pavilion where the, the, uh, the camellia tree was uh, remained mm -hmm. actually yeah. on the side. It was the only thing that stayed. It has an operable roof because they like to open up and grow um, in the natural um, for, for two and a half seasons here in New England. And then it can close in winter. Um, so this is Rano getting the greenhouse on his phone for the first time um, with Jen, um, who's been key on developing the sensor network. So he can be anywhere in the world and get all the data um, from the greenhouse. Yeah, and this is uh, some of the, the actual benches. In this case, they're lab benches where you lift up the top and inside it you have uh, the sensors uh, that and all the equipment that goes with it, the data collectors, and uh, those are distributed throughout, as are the sensors. So we're going to meet uh, Kaylee Hatley, and um, she and I will take you through. I'm Kaylee. Uh, I'm a junior at Wellesley College. I'm a biology major and a music minor. And here at the Global Floor, I do more work on the aquatic system. So that includes fish and other aquatic organisms, as long as working with mangrove trees. Kaylee is going to turn the camera so that we will see the global flora. What you're looking at is the camellia pavilion, and we'll be walking in there in just a second. A huge challenge was that this 140-year-old camellia couldn't be moved. We had to protect it, demolish the existing greenhouse, and build a global floor around it. The radius geometry of the pavilion is important since it maintains a constant environmental condition for the tree, and the flexible nature of the ETFE's envelope works with that. That butterfly vent on top opens in the summer since the entire building uses natural ventilation for cooling. At this point, as the greenhouse roof begins to rise, the slope descends. So we started out at about 15 foot height and now we're at about 40 feet height, which is, uh, allows for these larger plants, which will continue to grow to, to reach full height. Kaylee is gonna take us across the bridge to an observation deck, which has many uses, uh, a place for meetings, for classrooms, and to store extra plants, uh, this is a working conservatory, so there's always things moving around. From here, you can see the, the, the added height, uh, the fans. The, those are vents which are operable. The, it's an entirely AT, ETFE structure. You can see this fence and curtains. Uh, everything is managed on an Argus uh, building management system. We're gonna go down, uh, downstairs to the kind of marshy wet area of the rainforest. And Kaylee is gonna tell us a little bit about her research. Being about 2000 miles away from home and the first person in my immediate family to go out of state for college, I quickly felt out of place at Wellesley and lost at times. I remember one of my first winters here, it was cold, gloomy and dark with an unforgiving winter storm brewing. But when I started coming into the global flora, it was a whole new world. Warm, humid, and a cozy place. Definitely a Texas girl's paradise. <laughs> I felt like it was an escape from the stress and coldness of being in college, and it always put a smile on my face. I got to spend time alone, mostly, and I really looked forward to having time to think and be curious and explore my passion for aquatic systems and biology and animal behavior. Uh, so there was a time I, <laughs> there was also a time that I fell into the tank when I was doing one of the cleanings. That's probably a second best memory of mine. It was a very interesting day swimming with the fishes. <laughs> so one of the really unique and special things about our mangrove tank and about our global floor in general is our access to a sensor system. 
So some of our students and our botanical garden staff have been developing a sensor system, a sensor system that works throughout the global flora. In fact, I have a sensor right here. It's a, actually a pH and temperature probe. And so basically some of the sensors are in the soil and some are in our aquatic systems like the mangrove tank. And we have all access to the data at our fingertips. So it gets logged onto an automatic logging program that populates and changes on a website. So I'm not exactly sure how it works. Uh, it's very computer science-y, engineering, and I'm not really into all that, more biology, but I think it's great because it really helps me think past just the tank here at Wellesley. We can get reports for what's going on from the system anywhere. You can be in your bathroom, at home. I could be back in Texas, anywhere that you have an internet access or internet connection. So once we get more data, we can share the links to universities or high schools so they can get their data and make their own conclusions and do their own research. It's really just another great example of how the Global Fora was designed to incorporate learning and analysis and collaboration. In fact, I hope to use our mangrove data one day to make comparisons with mangroves around the world and see how it compares to mangrove forests in the natural environment. The plan is to use a public domain of data from mangrove forests in places like Florida, Vietnam, Indonesia, and then use an ArcGIS system, which is a mapping tool to make maps comparing things like temperature, drought, sea levels, uh, seawater temperature, atmospheric temperature, and see how they vary between a five and maybe 10 year span and see how, and track that along the progression of climate change and the research that's being done. So as I previously said, I really think the Global Fora is an educational tool for everyone, but especially I think for biology majors like myself, um, because another thing that the tank allows us to study is the interaction between biology and chemistry. So on one hand, we can study fish behavior, population growth, reproduction, and even dive into the fish body's surface and its function. But on the other hand, we can test water quality and things such as nitrates, nitrites, ammonia, phosphate, and pH to understand how these chemical compounds affect the fish and their health. So I feel like it's a little biochemistry, a little best of both worlds. Um, this tank provides a real life example for biology that literally swims off the page and makes science more exciting. Right now, because of COVID, this space is closed to the public, but hopefully soon it'll be bustling with people like a coffee shop at a busy campus. You can see that these projects are gonna be evolving. Um, the, next, the next project I'd like to talk about is called Plant Properties, a Future Urban Development. And um, at MIT, my colleague, um, Michael Strano, um, developed a whole new field called plant nanobionics. And basically he and his research team found a way to infuse nanoparticles into living plants so that they could produce um, ambient light. Um, this is not a, a form of genetically modifying plants. In fact, when the plants die, the light will, will be gone and the seeds uh, don't produce uh, plants that can produce light. So instead, we need to take care. It requires, it's an infrastructure or a future infrastructure that requires new forms of human care, new kinds of partnerships between plants and people. This is the process I was just mentioning. Um, you gently squeeze through the surface of the leaf nanoparticles that mesh with the living um, technology, if you will, if you want to call it that, the biology in the plant. It uses the plant's um, chemical energy um, to produce uh, low levels of ambient, uh, ambient light. And so we got uh, very interested in this and I decided to, to partner uh, with Michael and we, we got a Bose Fellowship to develop this project. And for me, just sort of culturally, it was super interesting to um, have the team begin to think about this new kind of synergy between plants and people. Um, and, and what that could mean. Um, and of course, there was some practical sides to the project too, because after all, it was like from MIT. So when you, know, you look at these very brittle, um, skanky diagrams, it doesn't really matter what kind of uh, fuel that you put in on the left. Basically, um, there's, a, there's such a tremendous amount of loss across the whole system. And by the time lighting gets to your home or your building, it's like 1%, um, 99%, um, or almost 99% has been wasted. So that seemed interesting, this sort of idea of really rethinking what um, a post-electric um, network could be. 
So we started to dive into this project because we had received an invitation um, from the Smithsonian Design Museum to be in the Triennale, which uh, uh, was, the, was on nature. And so we started to think about all these externalities, um, which, which we'd need to, to, to think about if um, we were to really invite plants into um, our building fabric, our existing building fabric, not just as house plants or pets, but as, as, as um, co-partners that require light deep into the building, that require excavation, massive amounts of soil, require water in different ways. And so we began to think about all of that. And we sort of recast this as a dark period, maybe a, a period in the future where resources were scarce, maybe electrical power is scarce. I mean, maybe it's actually a period that's a lot like now. And, and spots of light, just a little bit of light um, became a kind of form of luxury. Um, so how would we then represent this post electric future? I mean, that was one of the challenges uh, here. So we kind of enjoyed the idea of peoples, maybe that was a way where the public who now become looking through this citizen scientists are able to tell us back what it's like to live in this new future environment, this new future living where people are living with plants as their source of light, where people are using this to, to sleep, to read, to take showers, yeah, uh, to pray, yeah. you know, yeah. all, to dine, all of these things. And they got, people got really excited. I think we had over maybe a thousand. Instagram yeah, we have over a, a thousand citizen scientists who would use their iPhone live um, to take pictures and then upload that so we could see how the plants um, were doing. Um, so as, as Bono said, um, this, this is an incubator, what you're looking at. It's actually a sort of functional incubator that, that allows these plants to thrive in the, in the context of the museum where earth and water were extremely um, frowned on, I think you can say that, yeah. um, but snuck in anyway. Um, this is all uh, natural forces. Um, and it's also an architectural model of sort of a tenement building in New York, a familiar context for a somewhat unfamiliar new infrastructure. So looking in, um, people would see these domestic scenes and all the domestic infrastructure around it. So if you're having a, a dinner party with plants, then you also need to think about the tools for composting, the kinds of tables um, that would be used that would allow excess food to go directly down sheets in the building, vertical uh, shafts where compost and soil could start to collect all these different kinds of tools and picks, all the microbiome and bugs that would be necessary. You know, we're obviously drawing from Diderot's encyclopedia here, but we're trying to kind of create a new practice, a guidebook for a new kind of culture um, in this life. So, you know, this, this gift kind of takes you through um, the water share room, which is a bathroom where um, it's, it's not sanitary and white, it's actually glowing and green, and you commune with the plants in, in an entirely uh, different way. And of course, um, the, the, uh, the, the model, the architectural model also had to, to work. Um, so there was a whole system of plant watering that was gravity driven. All the sunlight that was coming in from the window um, was, was sent down deep into the building. It was sort of interesting to think about how to harvest light and how to bring in that kind of practice into a museum and into a building because we can't just put the plants by a window. If we want light, we need to have that light um, that, that plant light everywhere in our rooms, which means that daylight needs to come deep into the building. So we imagined all different kinds of acts of pirating, using these mirrors, people would adjust and tune the daylight according to the seasons. There was a whole kind of practice that was imagined around this. And then we used scale to kind of transform things so that you had the kind of tension between the architectural scale um, and the real scale of the plants, the earth and the water that were all are real um, in the project. So the goal is to produce enough light with um, ambient light to, uh, to read by. Um, and that is the next step of this uh, uh, project, which is actually ongoing. And we'll hear from two people from KDA who, who uh, were among the team who worked on it. You know, one of the really exciting aspects of the Plant Properties Project is that the scientific research is active and ongoing. 
scientists are in a lab right now at MIT working on how to make these glowing plants brighter and hopefully more accessible to everyone in the future. With that though, the planning and designing of the exhibit came with a lot of unknown variables and factors that we needed to figure out. Questions like, what type of plants do we use? How long could we get these plants to glow? And how long do the infused plant leaves stay healthy? And on top of all of that, how do we get these plants to flourish and grow outside of a lab's multi-thousand dollar incubator and inside a museum where the plants are not going to receive daily or even weekly care? I remember the first time that we turned on the exhibition Grow Lamp at the Smithsonian Design Museum and light flooded down the periscopes into the growing shaft. It had been carefully calibrated to work, but it was amazing to see this dark cavity become a glowing vertical greenhouse of watercress and mirrors. Every ray of light was like a precious resource. Although it seems pretty far out and strange to think about an installation that demonstrates an architecture of a post-electric vegetal future where people are depending on plants in new ways, um, this type of projective imagination and research is important to the discipline of architecture. It gives us a chance to expand opportunity to explore and apply the unknown while bringing new possibilities both into the architectural and in public realm that would otherwise be stuck within the bubble of a lab. I really like the soil option. The idea is that human engineered soil infused with nanomaterial is a new basic resource that everybody needs. Maybe it's the market smells different and it carries weird fungus, but that's okay because people have learned to deal with these new tastes. The idea of the market suggests that the best soil can provide the best light and it will earn the highest price. Perhaps if we were in the business of growing plants for other functions beyond food or aesthetic gardens, you could encourage broader ecologies to survive. The last century saw so much of the planet transform. If the next phase of existence on the planet has to be about restoring some kind of ecological balance, humans are going to have to organise society in a way that will actively engineer an equilibrium with the natural world, transforming our daily activities into different kinds of artificial plant collaborations. And then the last project that we're going to talk about is a project that's uh, also ongoing and very new. I don't think we've, we've shown it before. Um, and this, this uh, initial slide is a little bit of an insider core three joke, but Prano and I um, have done work on, on a variety of different uh, mountain villages, you know, from Baja to the Sierra Madre. Uh, we did uh, work bringing new infrastructure to informal settlements in Peru. And now we're working in Tajikistan, which is a significantly higher mountain range, you know, that's glaciated. Uh, we're talking about, um, you know, five to 6,000 uh, meters, so it's up there. Um, and we had the opportunity to partner with uh, Jim Westcote, who um, uh, was a professor at MIT, um, emeritus now, and the Aga Khan Agency for Habitat on this really incredible project where um, we were working to both plan and design a series of, of um, actionable options for a rural community um, in the Bartang Valley that had decided through their own form of self-governance that they needed to um, relocate to a safer place. So, um, what we're looking at here is the implementation of the and So our, our, one of our biggest challenges was to try to, to, to work with the village and find a way to bring water up to the plateau where they wished to go. There was an existing shepherd's path that took them up. And the dashed line shows the area, you can still see it, where there was an old um, Soviet um, aqueduct infrastructure that connected to a higher valley um, in, in, dark, in uh, 
uh, Devok Dara, um, the, the higher mountain range. But that wasn't really uh, operational because of the rock fall um, and some of the earthquakes. And so um, we were able to um, take Akka's um, drone footage and kind of do a top down and a bottom up hybrid strategy that was both kind of the planetary top down view and also very much a kind of bottom up um, villagers um, self, self autonomy uh, perspective. So we were able to get um, GIS uh, for vegetal areas, uh, for sunlight irradiance, and also for water um, from the drone data and to identify a place where the village could move that would be best because of the existing natural um, uh, uh, ability to have sun and water. Um, so we decided to use an inverted siphon, which is actually pretty common in the region. We visited several. Um, and that delta H there is the difference in the hydraulic head between the water in the upper valley and the cistern in the plateau. So as water comes down the valley, you can appreciate it that it just pushes the water up and um, uses the, the natural force of gravity, uh, essentially moving water to provide the plateau with a cistern which can gather water. So now we're looking straight up and that glaciated mountain um, is, is the Dublok Dara uh, Glacier. And that's the valley down which the um, new inverted um, hyphen uh, will run, um, siphon. Uh, now, the, the thing is that that's the best long-term plan um, for bringing water to the plateau. And uh, my colleague, Jim Westcoat is a hydrologist and he's, he's um, uh, uh, really an expert on this. But what happens in the everyday? That's where there's this kind of gap between planning and, and action and, and, and making things happen. So for every one of our long-term strategies with the villagers, we discussed with them and developed a super short-term strategy that was an option that they could elect to do right now. Like for example, taking the community truck, putting a water tank in it and taking water from the river up to the plateau using a repaired old car track and filling the cistern um, with the truckloads of water. By no means perfect, but it's a way to get started. And so we designed a series of steps that moved across every small action adding up over time. We spent a lot of time talking with various different people in the village where everything is made. Almost everything in this village is actually produced in the village across long periods of time. How people finish things, um, how they um, uh, carve wood, how they break stone for masonry. And the carpenter is hacking an old, um, uh, hacking an old Soviet uh, Jeep engine to drive his, um, his um, table saw here. And uh, he wears glasses, sunglasses, not because he's, he's hip or anything, but because those are his safety glasses. So everything has two, three, four different purposes. Um, and so working with the villagers and really trying to understand through many conversations with our translators, we developed a strategy that incorporated the way they worked locally, their local construction methods with um, uh, measures like using wire and also using wire mesh to alleviate um, uh, the, the seismic um, damage that could occur for earthquakes. So to make their, their way, of to, to allow them to keep doing their way of housing um, and building, but make it a little bit more resistant to seismic. So this is the kind of diagram that we started to make um, and the, uh, looking at um, how the poplar trees are milled for wood, um, how the large rocks and boulders are broken up and the kind of, of, of building systems that they have, in this case, a design that we're developing with the community for their uh, Jamat Khana or, or, or common house. So we would meet in these Jamat um, in the village and have many, many uh, meetings. It was quite a participatory process. I'm just showing you one, one slide of, of, of many, many meetings. And you know it's a remittance village like many of these um, uh, Tajikistan small towns are. So the men are away trying to send money back and it's the, really the women who run the show. They do a lot of the building um, and they do almost all of the farming. Um, so for the Venice Biennale, we're, we're uh, making a, a exhibition called Moving Together. And this is just a glimpse of the walls. We have tools that Ben will uh, tell you about in a second. Um, but we're trying to, within each circle, take a very discrete task and show how those tasks can add up over time 
um, to finally um, uh, produce uh, the entire uh, relocation of, of the village. Um, I'm working on this project. Uh, it's, it's a case study. There are a couple of other case studies by um, Janelle uh, Knox and also Miha Mazureo. And um, it's really interesting because this map uh, shows the amount of displacement due only to, to climate change, the natural hazards. And actually the line on the left, which is vertical, which has an arrowhead on it, is COVID. And I think we can think about COVID as a kind of a, a natural hazard and part of climate change as well. So this whole problem of how do you live together is really becoming a question of how uh, can we move together. So now um, we're going to uh, hear some tool stories um, from Tajikistan. Hi, I'm Ben Widger. I'm going to talk a little bit about these tools from the Bartang Valley that we have laid out here. In our context, building materials usually show up on site ready to use, but in the Bartang Valley, um, building materials come from the landscape, and that's often with years or decades of planning ahead of time. So we have just a few tools here from, from that area, um, and they range from things like a basket, um, something more complicated like this um, hand plane, and then even this, this harp saw. I'm just gonna pick out a few um, that have interesting stories. For example, the shovel. The um, village is run throughout with small canals and waterways that they maintained with these shovels. And actually when I was in the village, I could see on a daily basis how the water flow would change from hour to hour. And the villagers would actually use shovels to move small piles of soil and clay that would almost act as valves so that it would redirect the water flow from one villager's garden to another villager's garden on a prearranged schedule. The shovels are also used for planting poplar trees, which are the main structural root wood of the valley. Um, when a villager has a child, they'll often plant a stand of poplar trees that can be used as the roof structure for their home 25 years in the future when they grow up. And when that home is constructed with its wood roof structure and stone exterior walls, they'll use shovels to mix a kind of stucco that waterproofs the structure. Um, and that stucco is actually made out of clay, hay, and apricot juice. And apparently the apricot juice helps harden the material and make it more durable. The smallest tool we have here is a masonry chisel. Masonry is actually the primary building material of the village. Um, in conversation with the, a man who described himself as the master mason of the village, he explained how it, it takes years to understand how the local rocks split in specific ways, and then how those split rocks can be stacked securely in a, in a wall. So these are some of the tool stories. Learning from these stories and these people's knowledge and skills we designed a strategy for how the villagers could self-organize to relocate and rebuild their village on the high plateau. Okay, um, we're gonna end it and open it up to the KVA conversation um, with a couple people um, from our office who, who met in our office and uh, talking a little bit about what it's like um, to use the shop and to, to work there. So this is some shop talk. That's fine. You know, I think that relates directly to the sort of norm of the profession being, um, you know, at your desk behind an AutoCAD or Revit being a, f a fully digital um, occupation. Whereas, um, you know, here at KVA, we really emphasize the, the shop, the material, like the sort of bridge between um, that all digital focus. So we're not isolated from um, when we're contractors or assembling. We have a sort of idea or a lineage to trace between how what we're drawing in space in, in Rhino can then be cut and formed and assembled um, via the experimentation in our shop. Yeah, having these tools and these machines like a laser cutter or 
the CNC mill really helps our office accelerate the, the feedback loop between our design process and the very things that we're making. But even beyond just the um, you know, capacity to have these you know, fancy machines, like even just being able to work at a desk with some paper, some glue, and some tape, and make a very sim uh, simple, quick model, I think enriches the project ultimately. Yeah, I mean, I think I can see that even in the um, solar street lights behind us. And I think it's a, a really good example of a, a high-tech, low-tech project where um, it's pieces of string and bamboo, but then also 3D printed joints. Um, and I remember that even started with a model that was just pieces of cut cardboard and sticks we found outside. I think it really highlights the sort of strength of this hybrid digital and analog that <clears throat> we sort of um, push here at KVA. Um, we're not like abandoning our hands and our sort of the one-to-one -one tool to hand um, relationship so that the tool helps generate and um, facilitate you know, our design thinking and ideas, but also how it's executed, how things are cut, stacked, uh, assembled, you know, glued together. Um, like the digital is sort of informing this thread in between everything. Doing that work at one-to-one -one in the shop and then ultimately, um, even if it is the contractor building, even if it is a, like a bold, um, uh, atypical detail, you can have more confidence that it, it's doable, constructible. This might be a good opportunity to go upstairs and show you the prototype for the Haley ceiling panel. fun doing this in a shop with uh, half-inch uh, ash plywood um, and uh, one of the great things about doing this work ourselves was that we were able to kind of bring construction into the design process and that allowed us to iterate the design while prototyping and then making sure that we got all the details really right. So a couple of the key elements were uh, these perforations for um, the acoustic uh, panels behind and um, these vine shapes that uh, integrate the fasteners into the, the pattern of the ceiling. So the holes for the acoustic panels are uh, inspired by the shape of katsura leaves, which are the, the trees that are planted in, in the pavilion. And the shape is also repeated in the metal canopy outside that creates this dappled uh, light effect in the pavilion. As it becomes increasingly urgent for architects um, and other professionals in the industry to consider sustainability in the design process, I think the process of making allows designers to engage with our environment in a very particular way. We become very distanced um, from our environments as we sit in our offices. Um, but even in the example of the Tajikistan project, being able to actually be in the field and understand the systems at play and how particular trades and particular skills of making help a city become more resilient um, in their environment. In the Tajikistan project, it was extremely humbling to see um, this incredible community um, that people have built with very simple tools and just sort of the strength of the village. Um, so entire homes, elaborate uh, terrace systems made out of um, rock and stone. We could see the boulders that were the size of cars that they managed to cut down into uh, like perfect Gabian walls. Um, to know that they had managed to like rebuild their community um, again with so little resources um, was really incredible. And then to know that um, or 
to think, to hope that we could be part of helping them to rebuild in this um, voluntary relocation to an even safer space um, is really incredible. Okay, do you want to stop sharing the screen? Thank you. Um, thanks, uh, everybody, and, and thank you, Kevin, especially. Um, I'm going to invite Rania to come back, and everybody in the KVA um, Zoom room, if you would like to um, turn your cameras on, um, we'll, we'll warm up with some thoughts and reflections and maybe a few questions from Rania um, just to get the conversation going. And then we will open it up to see if there are any questions in the chat. Um, or, or, or people in the audience who, who would also like to join in the conversation. So thanks, Mani. Thank you, uh, Fran and Sheila and the whole team. Uh, KVA ends with the community and I think starts with the community. And that's one of the powers that I highly respected and appreciated. So I have a few quick notes and then um, I'm very eager to uh, open it up for the rest of the uh, attendance this evening. So I wanna make a few kind of keywords maybe that we wanted to drop in earlier, but maybe attempt to make um, steps and relations between them. So I'll do that maybe in four parts. And uh, hopefully that will speak to the strength of the practice and to the projects that we've seen tonight, an unbelievable skewer of uh, experimentations and, and really, uh, a uh, fantastic set to think through. So I would say one, maybe engaging reality through matter uh, and not representation. Uh, second, engaging matter through performance and not formalism. Uh, third, engaging uh, performance through the imagination and not precision. And then maybe last, engaging the imagination itself through design research and pedagogy. So it's kind of a, an ambitious four step, but a few words on that and hopefully uh, um, hopefully not obscure. I know that both Sheila and, and Frano uh, aspire for a communication that is uh, as inclusive and public as possible. So hopefully these, this is the spirit for my notes uh, this evening. So I think KVA starts from a position that an architect is political by being at the center uh, of her word and his word, by being in the practice. And that this is how architecture is a force when it understands the choices that designers make, the very choices of matter uh, that we heard about this evening, where it's sourced, how it's used, how it's manipulated and by whom. So architecture becomes this act of material circulation and asserts its, polit its politics by the manipulation of, of such matter. It's a work that remakes the world one building at a time and thinking at the building scale. So, if that's the way that architecture makes an impact by engaging reality through matter and not representation, how does it engage matter? Well, um, possibly from the longer history uh, of engagement that Anne pointed to in the introduction over this 30 years, it's an engagement to matter that began through performance and possibly as a response to the moment that KVA started uh, where maybe uh, a relationship to formalism was quite predominant and a thinking of architecture mostly through software inter, uh, interaction. So we come to explore matter through these projects, through minimizing waste, exploring craft, and maybe some of that spirit is explicit in the formulation of the earlier publication, material misuse. And I want to come back to that uh, design agency of misuse that starts from receiving standard materials, but take them beyond prescriptive rules. We've heard of the agency of the hacker, the pirate at various instances, And I think misuse carries that spirit of uh, appropriation uh, in that agency. So maybe to think about material implies this fundamental reassessment of uh, context to a point where in that transition to the project, you've seen that the living world becomes a technology in itself. So we encounter the plant now as the building material for a world in which climate change is pushing us to think beyond the binary of nature and culture and maybe how we understand material uh, altogether. So we stay with the scales at which the invitation uh, of thinking of the plant as uh, material performance invites us to do. So having made that narrowing to performance, um, 
maybe I would suggest that it engages performance through the imagination and not through a process of precision, as important as various acts of calibrations and, and measures are. And maybe that's how we become to uh, think, see the world as an invitation in itself to think across scales and systems, starting from unpacking the world to uh, kind of works where it takes up new clients, first that precious tree and the global flora project, and then inviting the trees as partners in the post-electric futures uh, to wrap up with imagining other ways of living in the world with other companion species, plants um, and, and others. Um, so how do we engage such imagination? If, the perf if kind of the performance requires an act of imagination, um, it, it, at the core of the practice of KV KVA is an engagement of the imagination through design research and pedagogy. So it's a, it's a process that works within uh, um, the discipline, but also across disciplinary silos, uh, maybe seeking an act of uh, uh, renovation rather than innovation per se, uh, staying with the with the parts, staying with the parts in their capacities and in their trouble. So that's an early and pioneering commitment that the model of uh, uh, KVA MATX has pioneered, notably that commitment to material research on various issues, the energy as it's manifested in the post electric futures, climate change as in the project of Tajikistan, staying with the localized forms of knowledge and craft. Um, so we're, we're kind of expanding the notion of the client, possibly with the largest project to understand moving together as a project for the planet at large, maybe through small acts of tactics, similarly to changing the practice one building at a time, adapting to climate change might require us to look at pieces, one stone at a time and one tool at a time. So I don't think it's a kind of a coincidence that the presentation invites us uh, and it's wrapping up to look at uh, tools more explicitly and, and material, to look at both uh, the shovel and the laser cutter, to look at uh, apricot juice um, at the same time as it looks at sensor technologies, kind of a re-invitation of the spectrum from high tech to low tech and everything in between. And in the voices of the community that uh, KVA is, uh, it's an invitation to, uh, maybe reform the practice one architect at a time as well. So it's a process of pedagogy that I think engages not only the continuing team at TVA, but I think first and foremost, the designers, the principals themselves who um, engage in that act of kind of curiosity of pleasure and knowledge and engagements that expands their own agendas to new forms of uh, care, be it, uh, dinner party with the plants or a breakfast with the trees. So thank you for this very kind invite and a fascinating overview of, of uh, these projects. I don't know if you wanna um, kind of say a few words or if you'd like me to open it up to uh, uh, whether Fran or Sheila or other, you know, other parts of the KVA team. Happy to see many of these faces again. I, I think we could open it up if anyone wants to tackle those. It's a lot, as, as usual, Ronnie <laughs> gives us uh, quite a bit. Um, but I think these are really, you know, uh, quite interesting things for, for our group to think about. Um, and we can just start with the kind of representation of reality through matter and, you know, not representation, which, you know, coming from Ronnie is, is a little bit of a provocation um, in, a, in, a, in a family way. Um, so do any of you guys want to, um, to comment on that? You can just unmute and, and just go for it. Well, I mean, I'll fill in a little dead air. Maybe I can requalify it because I'm, I'm also, I want to think about it. I, I think of difference in the most, uh, uh, in the most constructive ways that people, um, I think the, the, the binary is less between uh, representation and matter and less and more so between engagement and autonomy or kind of wanting to act in, on the world, in the world. I think the tools can be multiple, but the project of KVA has matter at its core. And it's a project that, you know, picks up that call at, at various, uh, through these various steps. So it's, it's, 
maybe just to say it's less of a provocation and more of a um, yeah. I mean, I uh, think that, that drawing can also be a way of looking at how material is organized in the world and drawing can do certain things that the existence of material can't do. So in reality, there they were not, you know, these are these are two different sets of tools with two different kinds of capacities. Um, it, I think you're right in that when when we started, um, there was a lot of so-called paper architecture, and um, the thing to do was to sort of create a graphic style and to you know to to use that. And um, we always enjoy and are are part of what we seek to teach each one teach one at, at KDA is actually how to make those instructions, how to actually make technical drawings, which we think can also be beautiful, though they don't perhaps engage the imagination in the same way as representational drawings. But I would say that there's a lot of that kind of drawing going on at KDA um, by all participants, you know, here, here, here shown. Um, that, and I would say the diagram too, is a tool that we that we use, although that's quite instrumental um, in, in some ways as well. So. Ronnie, I like very much the way you sort of linked together this cascade of words like representation and coming to matter and then coming to performance and then coming ultimately to the imagination. It's almost like a reversal time scale because it sort of all begins with the imagination, doesn't it? Because you might not have the tools for representation at that very, very early stage. Yeah. And in some ways, this kind of undoing uh, and the ability to kind of not start again, but actually you have to undo to get there. I mean, the Hayden Library, you know, it's just a, a an example of something where you just have to un you have to take away to get to to something else. Mm -hmm. um, A subtractive architecture. Or, yep. yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I'll also pick up on, and then really would like to turn it to anyone at KVA who wants to comment because we'll we'll have to open it to the. If you guys are all going to be very shy like this, we're going to have to open it to the general audience. Um, but uh, you know, uh, you mentioned. The, the the predicament, the kind of big paradox, is that one wants to change practice, one wants to shift it, perhaps radically, perhaps incrementally, but one also wants to be in practice, you know, while doing it. So how do you change practice from within? And so what resonated was your kind of staying with the parts, which reminded me, of course, of our friends um, staying with the trouble because the parts are the trouble. Um, in some ways, the, the materials that we do have to work with um, are those they are the problem, but at the same time, they're the means by which things can be built in most cases um, affordably or, and or on a budget. So how do we transform those existing things? How do we find innovation and make a transformation while still, without requiring a complete world change, you know, as architects of the modern period often did, who were revolutionary and wanted the entire building system to change before revolution X or innovation Y could occur. So perhaps, perhaps we're guilty of being too impatient. That's all. So maybe we can, uh, uh, maybe the KBA team would join with respect to some of the specific questions that are raised on, on the recent projects uh, around here in Cambridge. A couple of questions on the two recent projects or the one ongoing project, the Hayden Library, and then the recent uh, uh, Tozer and Anthropology building. So one is asking about the specific uh, detail regarding the sculptures that sit in, uh, um, uh, adjacent to the library or within the library and whether you're what will happen to them and whether you're involved in the process and then the other question maybe is looking at the longer history um, and inquiring about um, similarities between various ancient Sumerian Babylonian and courtyard strategies within the Tozer uh, anthropology building yeah um I don't know if Ned is here but Ned maybe you could respond on the Lipschitz um statues. Absolutely. Um, so the Lipschitz statues are going back, but now they're going to be placed in a much more 
kind of thoughtful arrangement um, and set into the landscape. Um, whereas before they were sort of on the stacked bricks in the center of the space and not really very accessible to people using the courtyard. So now you'll be able to sit right up next to the, the sculptures and we hope that they become a much more integral part of the courtyard space. Um, and for the question, I think it's an interesting one about the, the cultures and, and Tazer. Um, Tazer is a super opaque building. Um, it's a masonry building, it has a thickness to it. And um, certainly with, uh, with um, uh, uh, Professor Fash and his work with um, Mexican uh, Mayan art, there's mm. that kind of heavy thickness in that too. Yes, yeah. I think that was uh, something of a, uh, a, a bit of a reveal that we, that we attempted to do to be able to create that kind of opacity that then when, when one gets inside it, it uh, you discover this kind of space of, of light. And they're, you know, both are, both are libraries. I mean, what I, what I find interesting to this question, the series of questions that Rania, you brought up was that, you know, both of these buildings are existing buildings uh, and they actually come from the same time. And so to be able to kind of, you know, reimagine these existing conditions, not to go back to that same point and to resist this kind of temptation of the new after the new after the new, which suggests the kind of, you know, imagination only can come in a brand new box, as opposed to the imagination can be just as precise in kind of reinventing what's there. Mm -hmm. And it sort of gets back to what, you know, Daniel, <clears throat> Daniel Marshall was talking about in that kind of global world uh, view where he was commenting about being able to live with these systems these natural systems. And one of, these, one of the systems is the system that we constructed. But maybe the power of the imagination is precisely the fact that it isn't so precise, um, that it allows you to wander in your mind. And that's, that's a kind of a, a luxury in our super scripted world where you know, you're, you're, t you're uh, mm -hmm. told what to think and, and how to react all the time. So that I'm okay with that not being so precise or um, with, a project evoking a range of different imaginaries, you know, around its topic, as opposed to one didactic um, thought. So I think I can I can live with that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, yeah, a, and I, there's a you know I, I yeah I think that that question of uh, innovation and renovation is maybe is at core in these two projects that you mentioned, and and also as a pedagogic project, maybe if, if the kind of core three concerns remain, one of the earliest encounter with she that was around the icebox project kind of, and that also is, <laughs> is indicative of the choices of where KVA is based and you know what, what the office chose for a place to be. It didn't choose to build from scratch. It chose to insert itself as you kind of walked us through, uh, uh, through the, the building in a project that started with a structure. And I think that attitude of starting with uh, things in the world and not through an abstraction or an idea is, you know, permeates from the actual location to the way that that's, uh, you know, now, I think as a strength, as a, as a tool to the way we're going to have to think about climate change, it's, you know, it's, it's, yes, it's exactly. creating a, a material condition to respond to. Right. Um, so I think a new plan, that's, I don't think, right? No, that's, no. well, <laughs> depends who you ask. For, for many of us, I think we're going to have to stay here for a while. Uh, and, and, and that's not a bad place to be. I mean, at least from the kind of uh, initial exploration that we have, it kind of looks like the best place around to be. Um, so I think the, the next question is on the Tajikistan uh, project, but maybe it's, uh, it's, um, it's a broadly a question of how do you redefine the framework of the project, uh, maybe along the lines of what could be uh, feasible, kind of maybe a certain tactical or pragmatic uh, uh, attitude to make things happen in spite of their maybe larger scale. Mm. Yeah, I don't know, um, Charlotte or Ben, do you wanna take those? Um, I guess I, I don't have too much insight into um, the 
before our trip to Tajikistan, how we kind of um, conceived the project, but I know through the trip to Tajikistan, um, it ended up really um, being a, a lot more about learning um, kind of what, what their material culture is and how they construct their life. And I feel like that was surprising to everyone who was there. There was an incredible um, intricacy and craft and care to every square foot of this small floodplain that they live on. Um, and so I think um, through that process, we kind of ended up I almost, you know, shifting our mindset a little bit and it became a little bit um, more of a project about um, documenting and then reimagining um, rather than us kind of coming in and just um, feeling like we already had the tools um, to create an, a new situation for this, this village. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that, that is the case. And, and I think the question is sort of saying like, how did we transform it? I think um, the Aga Khan Agency for Habitat had been doing work for quite some time um, in this region. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's an underserved region um, that was quite um, biased by the, when the Soviet occupied, Soviets occupied Tajikistan during the Civil War, um, the recent Civil War. And so um, I think that the um, question of infrastructure was really fraught. So when we came in, I, I think we none of us wanted to just walk away with a planning project where we would make grand plans um, and then you know just basically walk away and, and who knows when mm. what would happen because there's not a lot of capacity uh, actually. Uh, and so we took the approach of let's make the plans, but let's really break them down. And so I think that that really did produce this idea of a, of a gradient of options and choices um, that could be incremental and, and additive, um, compromised, you could say, in some ways, but um, actionable. And so I think that was also the perhaps the input of KDA, who was a design firm consultant um, for the MIT team and also for um, the uh, ACA, the Aga Khan um, uh, Agency for, for Habitat. So we, we kind of brought that rubbing up with the material reality. And while we can plan the inverted siphon, and it should be done, I mean, it, it would be a great thing to have that. We can always use the truck um, and we can use some other measures, you know, while we're waiting for that to happen. Because in our work in in, in un, unevenly developed countries, we've realized that you can't count on the government. Well, forget une, unevenly developed countries, like look at our country. You cannot, you cannot count on the government to provide a kind of a common good in the way that maybe 50 or 70 years ago, one might, FDA or whatever, whatever benchmark you want to take. So there sometimes isn't the will, the capacity, the money, you know, or the ability to pr provide forms of infrastructure for a variety of different reasons, you know, in different countries. And so I think we can't count on the government. So how do we rethink planning so that it can be um, engage people's own autonomy, engage their self governance, and, um, you know, be uh, a little bit more bottom up, but not entirely tactical because it still has that larger strand of organization and how projects would um, resonate with one another. And there's a, a kind of a, an efficacy of, of, of planning things out that way. So I know that we're, uh, we have a few more minutes to go and there's always an invitation for those who wish and, and can to maybe join us through video kind of to uh, welcome, kind of thank you for taking us through the intimate spaces and processes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as a, as a, for, the, for the last few minutes that we have. And of course, always an invitation for those who have questions to either um, share them in the chat or if you feel like it, share them uh, uh, directly uh, um, through the platform through Zoom. So ask them directly. So you have a, um, a thank you note uh, from David from Toronto uh, on the uh, on on the the poetic sense of materiality and performativity. Um, 
And then there's a question on uh, species native to China, Southern Korea, and Southern Japan. Would would that we could have this evening's conversation over tea? Okay, so I think it's uh, it's someone who has the same aspirations and longing of uh, wishing to share uh, a moment and a tea, and maybe in a, mm -hmm. in, a yes. in one okay. of your beautiful the projects. So. Be with trees. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's. I mean, I think that's part of what the great thing the league has done, which is to kind of create this medium where we can kind of zoom to some different places and can construct conversations where we aren't always confined in these tiny Zoom boxes, you know, which is for um, educators and students, sometimes a bit class-like. Um, so it's nicer when we can have people talking to each yeah. other, even if it's recorded, um, without necessarily just being in one box, um, talking to another in, in another box. Yeah, I mean, it's forced us to think about different modalities for how, how we have these sort of open open houses. And I hope that, you know, I think, you know, having seen the series uh, that the League has put on, it's sort of, uh, you know, broken the box in a way, and it's allowed us to see how people represent uh, their their work uh, their work that's not exclusively about their own space where they actually work, but it's you know, spaces outside, spaces, you know, sites, um, even representations of sites. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. So, um, Rania, thank you so much. Um, I can't wait to uh, see the tape, um, listen to it on on uh, eagerly and um, the comics can continue. Um, the and league will eventually post this and there'll be, I assume there'll be a comment uh, section uh, and um, you can you can continue your questions and comments. And of course, as always, feel free to reach out directly to any one of us. Um, we're, we're kind of easy to track down if you have a question that, that didn't get answered that you, you wanted to raise. So. And we'd be happy to facilitate that. We'd like to thank the just amazing amount of effort that went behind that presentation. And it really took us inside and to hear the voices, the other voices in your office, the makers, and then also the people using the spaces was just revelatory and um, terrific. I'd like to thank all of you for coming. Next month, it'll be the second week in April, we'll be visiting Studio Gang in Chicago. Um, and I think that with each passing session, the possibilities for this format become, you know, clear and open up. And we truly appreciate the inventiveness that Sheila and Fano brought to this and um, Renya's interpretive response and carrying people's questions. So I think maybe a round of applause, which we can do in boxes is, is due. And thank you all of you for coming this evening. Yes, and a warm thanks to, good to see everybody um, at KBA and some KBA alumni too, so thank you. Um, yeah. So have a good evening, everybody. We'll see you at the next Hope to see you soon. Hope to see everybody soon.